you're an artist, you're a computer scientist, you, you're also a data scientist, you're also a data philosopher, and in our chats, I sort of thought about some of the questions that I could ask you, and one of them was, so in this increasingly complicated world, where we have so much noise, how do you find signal amidst the noise as a data philosopher? I think that one of the things that I worry about most in this discussion of signal and noise is that we would think that at this point in time, we know what the difference is. Mm. So I think that um, some of the things that we might think of as noise currently may turn out to be signal. I'm going to have some simple little examples, like um, in our rare book collection here on campus, there was a book that had a little smudge in the margin. Hmm. And now that we have the technology to sufficiently enlarge that smudge, it turned out to be a carefully hand-drawn symbol, which led a whole bunch of insight into this manuscript. And it's really great that the people who preserved this manuscript preserved it with reverence to the wholeness of it and didn't try and clean up as much, hmm. which might have been considered as noise. So, like, all the advances that we're looking at in some ways are sort of may not be seeing the full picture, the reality of things. And so that story sort of yeah. understates how, how much we have yet to discover along the way, even or, about the ground state, yeah. Yeah, even, like, our attitudes... There is a historian, Jonathan, jo Joanna Drucker, who studies how um, changing attitudes change history because we see history differently. Um, one of the places that she's famous about studying is the Salem witch trials, and we know we have a different attitude to them now than we did when they were occurring. Um, so as we mature as people, um, our ideas of what signal the noise may change. Is, is this idea of uh, uh, sort of language and or technology that only allows us to be able to see what it can at that point in time, and that changes as the technology progresses, is that what it was behind that smudge along the way? Technology was what made it possible to actually, at this point, um, re-see into that smudge. That's interesting. So the future looks kind of interesting in some sort of way. And I want to kind of probe a little bit deeper on this notion of a data philosopher. Do we need more of them? And uh, what does that mean to you? <laughs> well, you were the first person who used that term. <laughs> in, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I kind of thought, oh, maybe, because uh, ever since I've been here, I work with visualization. So I'm always working with data, with all kinds of different people's data. Um, so I'm thinking about data all the time and thinking about how um, the people who are expert in it are using it and how the people who feel alienated might want access to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about it all the time. So uh, speaking about data, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't escape my observation that there's a lot of it out there, <laughs> and uh, supposedly. What are the challenges and opportunities of our time and place in history where uh, in terms of signal versus noise in the context of all this data, big data, small data, data all over? Um, well, one of the things, so you probably, so, so now they talk about the data era, mm -hmm. and we talk so much about big data, but you kind of get the impression that it's for big science and um, big industry and big government because, like, it's mammoth and how would we actually access it or understand it. And I think this, you know, like about a couple of decades ago, they talked about the information age, and now they talk about the data era. And I think there's a secret in there. It's because the word information actually by definition means capable of informing us as humans. And the word data means that it's given and that it's the way it is kind of... Um, and there's nothing in it about that we should be able to understand it. Mm. So to me, that's kind of what all my research is about, is can I actually remake that data understandable, not just to machines, but to us as humans? Is, is this sort of, uh, this feeling of overwhelmness, I know I certainly have around data. Uh, how would I make sense of the world around me? Like, uh, what would be the kind of advice you would give me to try and sort of say, hey, Rahim, 
When you're overwhelmed in this world, this is how, this is how you should navigate some of the data. Well, there's a couple things. And one is that I think, you know, okay, I think there's a sort of historical parallel here that a long time ago we shifted from a bartering society to a currency money-based society. And that was, you know, a much discussed difficult shift for the general population who didn't at that point have access to what we consider totally normal education now. Um, so it was a difficult shift. And we now, I mean, and I think it's actually happened. We've, we, we have shifted to a data error. And I mean, if you think about it, uh, like data is the new currency. So if you think about, I mean, and this has been said a lot, what's the fastest growing taxi company? Uber. Yeah. And do they buy any taxis? No. Is it about money? No. Was the fastest well, it is growing... about money, but yes, it's about they money. don't buy taxis, yes. <laughs> is it, you know, similarly, was the fastest growing hoteling business? Airbnb, yes. You know, and Facebook and Twitter. And the people who are thinking about how to get the data or the information from the right people to the right people at the right time so that it's useful, those are the huge big things that are making huge big impact in our economy. And actually, I think almost the younger people that I meet, the younger they are, the more they know that that's what they need to be able to do. They want to be a player in our world now. They need to be able to think in data. And we don't really teach that. We don't teach that in grade school. We don't teach that in high school. We don't really teach it in university, even in computing science. We teach data management, data programming, but how to actually think about moving information around, who has what information, who might want it, when might they want it, so that that all works together, which, you know, as we've seen over and over again, is the secret for huge enterprises right now. Mm. We don't actually work with that. And we have actually, in Calgary, we've started the first, first year data thinking course open to all disciplines to get a basic idea about how to actually think in data. And I hear that our course is subscribed like over the limit yeah. at this point. Yeah, it's, it's full to overflowing and they immediately put another one on for the winter and it's full. So in, in effect, there are students who are realizing that the movement of that data is where the value add is. Yeah. And at this point, we have middle men, I guess you used to say, or women, who are the Airbnbs, the Ubers. They're trying to move that data and yes. extracting value out of it at that point in time. Right. And what's the next evolution to take out that middle, middle man in some ways and for consumers to connect with, with data themselves, people to connect with their own data? Yeah, I actually think, so I think, I mean, another thing, if we take another leaf from history, we as humans have been collecting data for a long time. They have examples of simple visualizations of data from 30,000 years ago, scratched on bones, lunar calendars, mm -hmm. things like that, where humans were making sense of the data of their current world. And very much through that kind of way, that's kind of how we became human. And I think it's really important that we don't give up the idea that this data, no matter how big it gets, is our data, and it's for us, it should be you know, it's about us, it should be for us, and we need to actually insist that we can understand it, that it's humanly interpretable, that um, providing, like the open data movement, providing access is not just a matter of dumping CSV files some corner of the web that are only understandable for people who have been, you know, studying databases for a while, we need to be able to understand it, to be able to know what is there and what is being collected about us. So I think there is this whole open data movement and that's super important. Mm. Um, and I also think that we need to think that lots of data starts as small. I mean, even if you think about Uber, it's just a little tiny bit of data. You just will say, I, I'm here and I want a taxi now. It's not, that's not big data. Um, so we have it in our own lives and we need to kind of regain control of that um, so that we can learn from it, reflect on it. It doesn't escape to me that in a, in a complicated world like this, th this kind of thinking would be so useful 
I know for me personally to try and examine what are the pieces of data that I'm giving out, that I'm part of, that I'm essentially selling for whatever service I'm getting. And it definitely made me think a little bit differently. Um, you know, I visited your lab, uh, and I, I, I've spoken to you a number of times and so on. What are the key pieces of work that you are part of now that have you particularly excited and that you would like to share at this point? Okay, there's kind of two things. One goes really along with what we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because, so, you know, I say, okay, fine, like the data is for you. Well, then how does it become for you? Um, and how, I mean, all very well to say we should change our education system so that people grow up learning how to think with data. But what about all of us who are adults and professionals? And, and like, what about us? We don't want to be left out. So how, how can we do that? And I know that in the research community, we, and definitely including me, had this assumption that what you needed to do is pair data experts and visualization experts, because visualization is an interpretive technology. Naturally, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that get them together and take a leaf out of extreme or agile programming, and that two people working together could like work this out. And a friend of mine um, ran, uh, Melanie Tori ran a formal study just to kind of shed more light on exactly how this process should work and discovered that it didn't actually work all that well. It was difficult. People weren't really enjoying it and they were having a hard time. So then initially in my lab, I kind of almost as a joke started thinking, okay, so we need to figure out what kindergarten visualization <laughs> is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, an exchange student who knew all about the history of kindergarten, explained to me how Froebel, who invented kindergarten, said that if we give children the right toys, they will learn abstract concepts by themselves. So we thought, well, what about giving adults the right toys? We like to play still. Um, can adults with the right toys figure out how to do visualizations themselves? And we ran a study with just people from the general population. Um, we actually ran it in Paris, and so these were people who happened to be walking past the Pompidou Center who would give up an hour in exchange for a coupon for a cafe, so they're just people. Um, and they all could do it. They not only could do it, they enjoyed doing it. Um, and some of them invented some pretty interesting and unusual visualizations that worked really well. Um, and what we've discovered since, and with other collaborators, um, we've uh, extended this into a workshop, and we've run this workshop in different places where we've combined this notion of giving people the right toys, which we just used brightly colored tiles. Um, we have done it subsequently with Lego. Lego works fine. Mm -hmm. um, and combine it with you know, experiential learning and peer learning, and discovered that people, in fact, one of the first places they ran one is um, at part of a big fair in Paris. So there were all kinds of other things you could do, like go on um, Ferris wheel rides and things like that, that you might think might be more appealing. But the people who came into the room stayed for the full three hours. And by the end, they were actually talking about visualization and data. They had actually done this transformation essentially so that they were becoming one of the informed and they were all super excited hmm. uh, so it, to, to me it's like it's possible you know it's 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 possible and it's not I mean it's not like they're going to go change professions and become a visualization person but it is like they're going to be able to read and understand and interpret visualizations that they see and that that whole world will be open to them the Sort of the, the call back to go back to kindergarten made me chuckle a little bit. Because it seems like in the, in the most highest tech of fields, the lowest tech of solu solutions seems to be the answer. The, ti Sometimes. the time to switch over your brain, to think from sort of uh, analog to data, but using analog means. Yeah. And that, that is absolutely fascinating. You can tell why I, I asked Dr. Carpetale to come and spend some time with us. And uh, I know that she'll be coming back with TEDx Calgary at a later time to deliver a talk with a little bit more time and preparation. But in these, in these times, you've given, us, given me a solution, I know. So thank you, Dr. Carpetale. Thank you, thank you very much.